Welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on keeping you informed on financial news and ideas. I'm your host today, Anne Berry, here to discuss expectations for interest rate cuts in 2024. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews that will help keep your portfolio on track. Today, we have with us Bob Elliott, co-founder and CEO of Unlimited Fund, Bob previously served on the investment committee of the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater. Bob, welcome to Leading Indicator. Great to have you back. And thanks so much for having me. So, Bob, we are speaking at a time when markets have been reaching new all-time highs. The S&P had hit a new record north of 4,900. 4, the Dow Jones Index reaching nearly 38,100. Some of the biggest upward moves we've seen over the last two years. So, Bob, what's going on? Why the sustained market optimism kicking off at 2024, where actually people have said this could be the year that we have a landing? Well, I think a lot of folks are finally recognizing uh, that the U.S. economy I mean, is, is not likely to move into recession uh, over the first half of 2024. I think a lot of expectations were that the buildup and elevation of monetary policy for the extended period of time was going to start to slow the economy, start to tip it into recession. Uh, but the indications are that... Uh, that that's that, that that that's not happening. If anything, we've seen some acceleration with real GDP growth coming in, going strong for the fourth for the fourth quarter, and demand in particular strengthening through the end of last year. Well, let's talk a little bit about what that means, Bob, for the rate cut outlook. If you re re rewind, we've been having this conversation two or three months ago. The market was saying there could be six, maybe even seven rate cuts in twenty twenty four. Where do you think the market is? anchoring its expectations now in terms of the Fed's next moves? Well, if you look at the silver curve uh, through the end of December 2024, what you see is the expectation of about 140 basis points of declines in short rates. So that's, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of five to six, uh, 25 basis point cuts through the year. And it's about a 50-50 chance starting in March. Uh, you know, that has, uh, that amount of cuts is a little bit less than what it was to start the year, but we're still talking about an extraordinary amount of cuts. And I think probably the most interesting thing is if you look at the options implied path of interest rates, there's still almost a 30% probability priced in that we have interest rates below 3% by the end of December. That's a financial crisis style set of, of cuts in interest rates um, that is currently you know being priced in at a reasonable probability. So Bob, Break this down for us. We've got inflation trending towards 2%, the Fed's target. We've got GDP outperforming. We've got unemployment close to historical lows. Why should the Fed cut at all? Isn't this the Goldilocks situation? Yeah, it certainly sounds like a soft landing to me. Um, and I think, I think that's a really interesting question, basically, which is, you know, if... If all things considered, if inflation was at the Fed's mandate, unemployment was at secular lows, and growth was well above potential for six quarters in a row, that's yeah. technically not the time that you see that magnitude of cuts that come in. I think the real question is how much uh, does the Fed think that the current level of interest rates is in terms of how tight it is? Um, because, you know, you do have inflation that has sort of stabilized at 2%, at least for the for the medium term here. And so I think there's some hesitancy to leave rates at this level, thinking that real interest rates, the difference between the short rate and the inflation rate is still a little high given the nature of the economy. But that might cause the Fed to cut one or two times. It's not the sort of thing that's that's consistent with five to six cuts over the same time period. But let me push a little bit on this. That why the assumption that it is, quote, too high given this economy, right? If we look back in history, rates have been a lot higher than we've been seeing over the last couple of years. GDP growth is still outperforming. What is it that's too high about these current rate levels given everything seems to be going pretty well? Well, I, I think you're right when you look, you know, the, the what is a neutral interest rate in the economy is not a theoretical concept. It's an empirical right. concept. And if the economy is going pretty well, and, and to be clear, it has gone well for six quarters, 
during yeah, a more course. elevated interest rate environment. So those folks who are saying, well, the lags and the lagged effect of interest rate hikes will eventually show up. It's like if the lag effects so of the interest rate hikes are going to show up, when are they going to show up? Because interest rates have been, you know, have been elevated for quite a while. Exactly. Right? I think it's mostly Fed economists who are running econometric models that are highly focused on, you know, the post GFC period who are benchmarking mm -hmm. neutral at 2.5% instead of looking at the empirical evidence of how this economy is doing, which looks, you know, suggests that maybe the neutral, the neutral Fed rate is a lot closer to the 5% that we saw in the 90s than the two and a mm -hmm. half that those economists are predicting. And and so, Bob, just to, to hone in on that point a little bit more, what is it that could have driven a change in the neutral interest rate? Is it the underlying rate of productivity growth? Is it underlying labor participation? Like, what exactly is it that could have changed that anchor point? Well, I think there's a couple different things that have strengthened the underlying structural growth in the economy. Uh, a big one is that we've had a big shift in uh, debt conditions, you know, household debts today as a function of the significant increase in incomes, nominal incomes over the course of the last 15 years and the pay down of all that debt that was built up prior to the financial crisis, had, the debts have been meaningfully restructured. And a lot of that debt service was locked in at very low rates. Um, when rates were, were were low, the same thing is true for corporations. And so the debt burdens that existed post-GFC have moderated. We have seen a pickup in productivity in the economy, probably not what not driven by sort of AI and technological innovations, but more traditional cyclical productivity improvements that happen late cycle. That raises the the baseline interest rate. And we have seen increased labor force growth in the last couple of years particularly related to immigration, you add all those things up. No one of them is so significant that would meaningfully shift uh, the, the benchmark neutral interest rate, but you put all these things together. And again, we might be seeing sort of neutral interest rates in this economy that look closer to four or four and a half than they do to two and a half. So with all of that in mind, Bob, the Fed's first FOMC meeting of 2024 set for January 30th, 31st, what could happen? What's going to happen? Look at your crystal ball for us. Uh, nothing is the answer. Nothing's going to happen uh, at that meeting. Uh, and that's because the Fed, you know, nothing's priced in to happen. And the Fed generally doesn't want to surprise markets on a short-term basis. You know, we're recording right now about five days before that meeting announcement. Um, uh, the real question is going to be what's going to happen in March and how the Fed frames in the subsequent press or how they're thinking about the incoming data and what their reaction function is and how much are they weighing the strength in economic conditions in terms of being a bit hesitant to ease further relative to the declines in inflation that we've seen. How they weigh those things will become a little bit more uh, apparent in that presser. And so I think that's really what folks are going to benchmark on because March is still priced 50-50. And so there's a lot of ambiguity about whether they deliver the cuts that are expected. So, Bob, let's look into your crystal ball. You said the Fed does nothing. How does the market respond to nothing? Well, I think that the main question is going to be whether the Fed gives any indication that they're not likely to pursue the pace of monetary easing that's currently priced in the short rate markets. The Fed expresses any hesitance uh, either around the, uh, the level of inflation or that the strong growth that they're seeing in the economy might cause them to to pause or go a little slower in the easing cycle than uh, those five to six, six cuts that are currently priced in. I think that'll be tough for the bond market to absorb. Uh, and in addition, you know, from the equity side of things, I think, you know, they're going to key off of what's going on in the bond market. They'll get quite the easing that's expected. It probably won't be too bad for the equity market, but it certainly won't be as good as if the Fed confirms the easing path currently priced in. Let's, let's talk about the debt markets, Bob, and give us some insight into how they've been performing, just given how on fire stocks have been this year. Well, I think we've seen uh, in, the, in the second, uh, the last couple of months of 2023, you saw bond markets and stock markets really performing uh, equivalent to each other. They were in line with each other. And that was consistent with the broader sense of a shift to easing across the economy. But what's changed since the start of the year is that the strength of the economy is starting to create a much more typical set of intermarket linkages where stocks 
keep outperforming bonds. It's been one of the mm-hmm. best periods over the course of you know three or four weeks for stocks relative to bonds in a long time. And that just reflects the recognition that there's strong growth in the economy. So going back to monetary policy, assuming that the rates, uh, rate levels stay on pause, at least in January, let's assume that we have a cut. Let's go with June, just for now. What do you think the bond market is going to do as, as we edge towards that summer period? And then as we head into full throttle election season? Yeah, I think the real question uh, for the bond market is how is the Treasury going to choose to finance the significant amount of fiscal spending and deficits that are still present? Uh, and that will really come down to how Janet Yellen positions what's called the quarterly refunding announcement on January 31st. It's actually uh, an appetizer, a policy announcement to the Fed later in the day. It comes at 8.30 in the morning. If she chooses to increase bond, bond issuance, duration issuance, that could be very concerning for the debt markets and cause a rise in interest rates. Alternatively, she could increase the share of bills, short-term debt that she's issuing, which would have uh, a supportive effect to the bond market. What she chooses to do is pretty uncertain right now. And so I think that'll be a real focus for answering that question of what's likely to happen for the bond market over the course of the next three or six months. To finish off, Bob, let's take your insights. You understand the macro and ways to trade. Uh, in multiple areas, Can you, could you just take a minute to help our viewers understand how derivatives and options come into the mix when trying to understand investing strategies wrapped around the macro sphere and, and trading macro trends. Futures as well as options are really useful tools to gain exposure in a way that might be more cash efficient than going out and buying cash securities, ETFs, et cetera. Particularly on the short side, they're very, very cash efficient instead of having to pay borrowing costs to borrow securities to express those views. When you think about trading macro markets, it really comes down to risk controls. You don't want to be taking on more risk than you expect. And options, in many cases, are efficient ways to implement risk controls because you can have a very well-known, well-defined amount of cash risk that you're putting on the table relative to the position that you're getting. In many cases, even very, very skilled professional traders use options regularly to express opinions because they help them know what their downside risks are. And a great place to to round off, Bob, because your company, Unlimited Funds, holds an ETF that's trying to replicate return characteristics found in the hedge fund industry. How are derivatives being used in your strategy to to mimic that hedge fund performance? As you said, they're used by professional investors to try to to optimize. How are you guys using them to get that hedge fund style performance? Yeah, a lot in a lot of cases, um, you know, securities options as well as futures can be uh, just a much more efficient way to implement a strategy. I said, particularly there on the short side, where uh, it might be more efficient to hold futures contracts or options relative to holding uh, the cash ETFs or, or or the individual cash securities themselves. And so it's really just part of the tool the toolkit. Uh, for any one of these exposures that you're trying to take on at any point in time, there's a lot of different range of different options, but you definitely want to have futures. You want to have options in your toolkit because they provide a unique frame of exposure that can be more efficient, cheaper, more liquid, uh, more cash efficient. Uh, than uh, a lot of the options that may be out there otherwise. Bob Elliott, co-founder and CEO of Unlimited Five, as always, thanks for joining us here on Public Combat. Folks, love to see you on the next drop of Leading Indicator. Thanks for having me.